and gentlemen, this is the Rebus Debate 2019 holding here at Aztec Arkham in Port Harcourt. And tonight, we will be having candidates from the various political parties that have been selected. But to drill the questions tonight, there's no one else but three very wonderful personalities. I'd like to welcome the moderators to the table. Join me as we welcome tonight Mr. Shegun Owulabi, an on-air personality at the Rhythm of the 3.7 and a host of Viewpoint Port Harcourt and talk of the town on Rhythm number 3.7. Mrs. Shegun Owolabi, you're welcome. The second moderator tonight is Mrs. Florence Kayemba Ibobasi of the Social Stakeholders Democracy Network, SDN. Mr. Florence, Mrs. Florence, you're welcome. Take it nice and slow, easy. The third moderator for tonight, Mr. Kofi Patels of 93.7 Nigeria Info FM and the host 92.3, Nigeria Info FM and host, the reverse I want. Who else would be the moderator but the man that wants a better reverse? Kofi Patels, you're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our candidates for tonight. The political parties, as we see here, are SDP, PDP, Labour, ADP, and of course, our court party. But we have the following candidates present, and we'll be welcoming them right now to the stage. Let's make welcome the SDP candidate, Mr. Precious Elikima. Please, SDP candidate, Mr. Precious Elikima. We also have tonight the Labour Party candidate, Mr. Isaac Wawu. Let's welcome Mr. Isaac Wawu of the Labour Party. And the third candidate for tonight's debate, ladies and gentlemen, is no one else. The ACP candidate, Mr. Victor Fingesi. Please, let's welcome Mr. Victor Fingesi. Please, no chairing, no political chairs, please. This way, sir. This way. You're most welcome. Now, the ground rules, just for us to note and follow strictly. Each candidate. We'll be giving three minutes for their opening statements. And after that, they'll go into the question sessions, which will comprise of economy, security, and government. Questions will be posed to each candidate, and they have three minutes each to respond to the questions. After that, there will be a follow-up question, which will require two minutes to respond to the follow-up question. And after that, the questions will continue on each round, economy, security, and open governance. Interjections and interruptions. There will be no interruptions, clapping, cheering, booing, and whistling, or any form of distractions from the candidates or from the audience. Please note, the candidates will get a warning bell, one ring for one minute remaining, and a final bell, two rings, to conclude your timing. For the audience, take note of this. The audience is an invite format only. And therefore, we expect that all the audience will be well behaved. No party slogans, no cheering, no clapping, no booing of any kind. Any form of distraction, please, if it is noticed, you might as well just be escorted out of the building. Note that we will take it as a serious offense against this debate, as we expect everyone to be well conducted and well behaved. The audience should also restrain from clapping for any particular candidate whatsoever or creating any form of distraction during this debate. Remember, it is the 2019 Rivers debate. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome the chairman of the planning committee of the 2019 Rivers debate in the person of Mr. Bob Manuel. To be fair, let's put our hands together this time after which we revert to the rules. Mr. Bob Manuel, you're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, um, I'll, uh, I'll seize the opportunity to uh, invite our trustee, uh, Chief Odoli Lolomari, to be accompanied by uh, George Nkoyo to bring forth the questions. So, Chief Odoli Lolomari and uh, Mr. George Nkoyo, Engineer George Nkoyo, to bring forth the questions. Thank you. Well, as they do that, I would... Um, is the opportunity once again to uh, welcome each and every one of you here 
it is our distinct privilege and honor to having you here. We, the organizers of the Rivers Debate 2019, and our developmental partners, stakeholders for democracy, Rivers Entrepreneurs and Investors Forum, Nigerian Info, Who Azovia, Redim 93.7 FM, Silverbed Group, Enough is Enough, Social Action, Business Day, and Nigerian Debate Group. Most importantly, with uh, the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. It is indeed important for us to identify where we're coming from to appreciate how far we have come. We had the first edition of the Rivers Debate, which was held in 2015, Tag Rivers Debate 2015. And we had a lot of spin-offs from that event. And one of the, some of the highlights, I would seize the opportunity to draw to your attention because maybe we might not have any other opportunity, not until another four years from today. After the course of that debate, we came up with, a, with, with some kind of broad understanding between the various candidates, which was made known to the eventual winners of that event, eventual winners of the, uh, what do you call, of the uh, event, the election. And some of those items, I'll quickly just highlight them. One of that is the fact that we as investors, we as private sector, we felt that there should be a need for us to be able to have some traction around the seaport. And to that end, in the communique that we eventually produced, had the seaport in it. But we identified the fact that the states really can't do all of it around the seaport. I identified that the state could do was fix the roads. And you would agree that those roads were one of the fixed when the addition came into power. We identified issues around the MSME markets, namely my one market, fruit garden market, abattoir market, LMA, uh, what do you call, um, uh, what do you call, oil oil market, and all of that. And we put all of that into the communique, and true to type, some of those markets, a major chunk of those markets have been fixed. We had issues around the infrastructure, the roads, and all of that, Transamadi and all of that. Transamadi, as I then was done, about 50% or 40%. But that formed part of the communique. And today, Transamadi is indeed being fixed, or had been fixed. We had issues around the courts, because we felt as investors, it's going to be difficult for us to ventilate our issues when it comes to legal matters. So part of those items were all embedded in that communique. Without taking too much of our time, it's important for us to understand that we're still going to produce another communique today to your excellencies in such a manner that if you follow through, which will be coming from time to time to give you soft nudges on how you're going to achieve them. And when all of that is done, we believe strongly that River State would have made a major stride forward. Because going by the research and analysis we have, right in front of us. River State could generate as much as 50 billion as its IGR in the next four to eight years. And those are very ambitious figures. And we believe if we follow through this process, practically, systematically, River State could actually harness its true potential. So I'll seize the opportunity to say a very big thank you to each and every one of us. Sit down, relax, and enjoy this one of a lifetime experience. Thank you. And that will be the last hand clap for this event. So thank you, you enjoyed it. I'll hand over to the moderators. Just before then, I've just been informed that when the contestants hear the ring, that means your time is up. Initially, we have thought we'd give you a warning signal, but there's a clock in front of you, so you watch your time. The moment you hear the ring, it means your time is up. Over to the moderators. Thank you. Thank you so much. Candidates, may I welcome you once again to this debate. Now, quickly, you have three categories of questions that will be asked. We'll be asking you questions on economy. We'll be asking questions on security. 
and we'll be asking questions on open governance. For each of the questions, you have three minutes to give your answers. We'll give follow-up questions, which you would have two minutes to respond to. Once again, I want to welcome you. We'll start quickly, and here we're giving you the first four minutes each. Introduce yourself the way you would want us to know you, and tell us why you want to govern River State. And I will start with candidate ADP. Your time starts now. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Victor Fingesi. I'm from Okrika, here in River State. I was born in Jos, Plateau State. I started my early education there, and I went from there into River State, where I went to school in Okrika Grammar School, then furthered my education in London, the United Kingdom, and finally in Los Angeles, United States. I am here in Nigeria after graduation to see that things are not the way I think they should be, especially in my dear River State. I have been heads of different organizations, especially um, I've had a lot to do with the youth in Nigeria. I am currently the president, Nigerian Baseball and Softball Association. I was one time president of the Portacot Polo Club. I make sure that youths are properly handled when it comes to the organizations that I've run. I am a security expert. I work for a company called Dewu Nigeria Limited. And today, I'm a politician seeking to govern River State. And my main reason for trying to govern River State is that I want to bring peace to River State. I want to bring political peace to this state. I think that River State, the way I've seen River State in the last few years, is going the neg negative direction. And I think River State can calm down and become like other states. This is the reason why I'm here. I want to govern River State and make sure that people in River State live happily, live wealthy. It can be done. So I see no reason why we are here and allowing our state to run down. Thank you. Thank you so much, candidate ATP. Candidate Labour Party, you have three minutes. Tell us how you want us to know you and why you want to govern River State. Your time starts now. Let me thank all of you, the organizers of this all-important debate. My name is Chief Isaac Wong. I'm an engineer by profession, an employer of labor, a farmer, I help from Ikure in River State, I have followed up the political activities and developmental processes in River States. I have considered with all the rival issues, the developmental strives with respective administrations in the past 16 years. I have no doubt they have done their best and I'm of the position and view to serve rivers people much better than they have said in the past few administrations in the state. I am very much convinced with the rival issues which has wasted us so much resources of this state that if we make a change and accept the governorship candidate of the Labour Party, I have no doubt that will bring about a robust development in this state. This I want to assure you this is our commitment as a party. This is our commitment as a group. And this is our commitment, I have no doubt, to join 
with the organized labor, organized labor unions and the entrepreneurs in bringing about a wonderful state for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, candidates, Labor Party. Candidate SDP, tell us how you would want us to know you and why you want to govern with the state. Your time starts now. Thank you. My name is Precious Selekima. I come from a very small village called Bukuma. My father was a teacher. My mom was also a teacher. I have many brothers and sisters. And we learned two worlds of poverty and wealth. I am here running for the governorship of River State because we live in a period of fears. We have lost everything that mankind longs for. We do not need more evidence than what we are seeing today. And I want to restore the basic that mankind needs. First is freedom. Second is prosperity. Third is peace. And I do know that we are not too sure of ourselves. Nobody is too sure of the meal he wants to eat. Nobody is too sure of how safe he's going to come back home. We have too many mothers who do not recognize their children that they had. And they were so proud to have their day parties. For. These children today have turned out to be terrorists on the streets. We have too many widows who didn't begin to be widows at a very young age. That because stray bullets have hit their husbands and breadwinners, today they are widows. We have too many offices closed because there is no businesses to do. Why? Because our economy has turned away. They are filled in black spaces. And for that reason, when able-bodied men and women have no job, they either starve or they steal. And in our very good conscience, nobody wants them to starve and nobody wants them to steal. But something has to happen. And most of them have taken the part of not starving to death. And they have taken the stealing avenue, which has today driven them up to the point of kidnapping, arm robbery, that has made most of us abandon our beloved homes and have gone into exile, living just with one eye closed. Everybody sleeping in the world of fears at this time. So I feel that I have a duty to bring back those things that we need and to create, an, create a society where we have the three basic things that all mankind longs for, which is freedom, prosperity, and peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, all candidates. And we go now to the first set of questions, and this will be on economy. In this part of the debate, we'll be asking candidates questions that focus on one of the toughest problems the face states and Nigeria as a whole, economy. And now to the question. River State, like other states in Nigeria, is heavily dependent on allocation from the federal government, which is largely based on oil. It has seen recent improvements in internally generated revenue, but revenue remains under 300 billion naira. Budgets in River State has often seen very large differences between realistic revenue estimates and the demand identified by state ministries and others, which have frequently put government expenditure at around 500 billion naira a year. And this shortfall often leads to heightened expectations because items are in the budget, but shortfalls means that many will not be implemented. Candidates, what would be your approach in addressing the present shortfalls between revenue expenditure, limit government expenditure to the money available, or create avenue to get extra 300 billion naira, which real estate requires. How will you proceed? 
And I'm starting with you, candidate Labour Party. Your time starts now. The revenue issue in River States and the IGRO has maybe required to develop the state as Labour Party. Our concentration will be to diversify the economy. We need to diversify into agriculture in developing an agri base and re-engineering the state to be able to develop another direction of, the, of getting more revenue for the state. In agriculture, we intend to get out rice cultivation, ensure that the state can as well produce large-scale rice production. We can as well go back to the agri-base of cassava production. Every product that comes from our farm has value chain. And if we introduce a mechanized system in every LGA, it will create avenue for our seeming youth, mother and father, to be able to feed ourselves. We can as well produce products that we can as well get to the level of export. In the same process, we intend to produce, I mean, establish and a microfinance agency that will support people for agribusiness. Next, we want to do and deconcentrate ourselves from the oil revenue. This, we consider we can as well generate work and job for our people. This, we feel that our rural area can diversify in feeding itself. And I have no doubt if we establish and diversify our, our economy direction, we will actually improve on our revenue base. Thank you so much, candidate Labour Party. Candidate ADP, given the assumptions and given all the facts available, what would be your approach to addressing the present shortfalls between revenue expenditure, limit government expenditure to the money available, or create avenue to get extra 300 billion naira? which Rigo states requires. Candidate ADP, your time yeah. starts now. 300 billion naira shortfall is a lot of money. And I don't think that it is possible to do in River State the way we see River State today. We need to rebuild River State before we can see those revenues, those figures come back up. If you don't rebuild River State, if you don't create the security that is required for investors to make the move to come into River State to invest, then that shortfall will remain for a long time, till after our lives, most of us here. So I think the most urgent thing to do will be to rebuild River State, restructure the entire state. What our founding fathers left, if we revisit it, it would be a short while, and we'll get back to balancing our IGR with our internal generated revenue, and that shortfall can be met. First and foremost, um, the insecurity that we see is created by us. It's not created by Lagosians. It's not created by uh, people from Anambra State. It's created by we in River State. So River State government and ADP government will bring everybody together that is disrupting the security of the state to a roundtable conference where we'll agree on how to stop insecurity in the state and creates that level uh, environment where or enabling environment where it will attract uh, investors to come. Well, we will do a lot of investments. I can't see why River State cannot own a petrochemical plant while the oil industry is here. We can be running away from the best um, mineral that we have in our state. So River State government will also invest in um, the oil industry. One, we know that our environment is destroyed. So I think we need to get the investors to help us in investing in areas that can secure and protect our environment. Modular refineries, so that everybody is at peace with himself. Where the oil companies are happy that their oil will be taken and paid for, and where those taking it would sell and make some money. So everybody will be at peace. I think we need 
to rebuild our state so that this shortfall you're describing can be bridged in little or no time. Candidate ADP, thank you so much. Candidate SDP, what will be your approach to addressing present shortfalls between revenue and expenditure, limit government expenditure to the money available, or create avenue to get extra 300 billion naira? How will you proceed? Well, time starts now. Well, my approach will be short-term and long-term approach. Short-term, be able to look at what is recurrent expenditure and look at the capital expenditure. Now, be able to meet up the recurrent expenditure. That way, we do not have pains in families that are already working. And then we know what we now have. Now, I already have a policy that I'm going to decentralize the government where all communities will have their resources, 35% of their resources, because there are three things that make people to develop any area. First is interest. Second is affection. Third is duty. Now, I also know that all communities are blessed with one raw material or the other. And we are going to encourage and support all communities to explore their raw material within the area where they have comp what they have comprehensive advantage of. Now, when we do this, we will see there are various ways of overcoming budget shortfalls. Now, there are those that we can look into by policies and bring down the cost of living bring down the cost of living. If we are able to achieve so much by bringing down the cost of living, that also means that you earn some money because, first of all, how much do we need to service these budgets? You may discover that we have, and we may have situations whereby we are spending money into unnecessary areas. So we look at those areas and cut on those areas. Then we now intensify our action, our, our um, we intensify actions in making sure that all the communities start exploring their raw material and start building local economies. And most of these local economies they will build will help to build up our tax system. Because if they are building their industries and they are raising money and they are paying taxes at the center to the state government, that increases our portfolio. But you know what? They need to have money. If you just build industries and there is no buying power with the public, they will not be able to buy. And so there are some social responsibilities we will take as government to enable them to have money to be able to uh, patronize the industries. And one of such is first, we'll look at some essentials of life. One is housing. We'll see how much housing we can provide and make sure that the public can now buy the houses on mortgage level and pay gradually. That leaves them some monies in their pocket to be able to service the industry. Thank you so much. Candidates, I want to thank you so much. Oh, we have we follow follow questions, questions to, to your, your answers. Candidates, ADP, you mentioned um, setting up measures to protect the environment, largely because of the environmental degradation in some parts of uh, River State and looking at how the oil industry can help set up investments where they can. However, there are concerns that perhaps the over-reliance on oil, which has obviously propagated the Dutch disease, is something that we have to rethink. And therefore, what efforts do you think need to be made for River State to be able to diversify away from oil? What other types of industries or sectors can actually be boosted for this to happen? There are other sectors of the economy that River State must diversify into. No one product is enough in any economy. Multiple products, income from all those products, creates robust economies for other countries. Of course, in here in River State, we must do a lot of agriculture. We cannot continue to do agriculture in the way we do it today. We cannot continue to allow our mothers and aged uh, parents to suffer in the farm. 
we must make sure we mechanize our agriculture. If we diversify, it will create jobs for us. If we diversify, we will export a lot of products from here because mechanized farming will feed river states, feed our surrounding states, and still have a lot of our produce to export. We need to diversify. I quite agree with that. But also in river state, we should not forget that what makes an economy to grow from nothing to a robust stage is the activity of the individuals who live within that economy. We must train and retrain and retrain rivers people in different, in different fields, fields. Skill, skill acquisition, acquisition so that so our, our rivers people would have, would have what, it, what takes it takes to get into, to get into different, different types of businesses which are, which are readily available and, and would help, help uh, the, economy the economy grow. Definitely, Definitely rivers state cannot, cannot remain a mono economy. economy. He is planning to, to diversify to when his economy is down. Where will he get minutes. money to diversify? Asking that question. Lagos makes over 30 billion monthly from seaports. And most of the importers are from, from the eastern part of Nigeria. And we have two seaports here, One and Portacot seaports. So we must find out what is the reason why our seaports will be idle, and Lagos is making over 30 billion a month. We must see if it is political problem, whatever problem it is, and make sure that the seaports come back on stream to work. The second part of it is that we go into education, especially technology. As oil is going away, it is technology that took over from oil. But we are not in the te technological world, so we need to go back to the universities and see how we can also be in the technological world. That which means we must do inventions. Today is carried by smartphones, iPad and all this. Which of these do we manufacture? None. So we should be able to go into the technological world and see what we can do. You know, I think that this is the easiest way. The other one is that we, we, we will explore our raw material, which is about 90% agro-based. And we are sure that we are able to raise a lot of uh, food, all sorts of uh, byproducts of agri, and be able to make exports and all that. But principally, we have to go to the technological world and see what we can do so that we can also export technology. Just like uh, Congo is, explo is exporting coltan for the manufacture of uh, flat screen. We don't know what minerals we have deposits in our various villages and towns. Thank you. Candidates Labour Party. You talked about diversifying the economy of river states, but we're talking about the economy that is already in problems. How will you get the money that you will use in diversifying the economy of river states? Two minutes. With the resources we presently derive from the federal government as oil revenue, with the training and reorientation of our manpower, with the sustenance of our basic oil industries in developing intermediary manpower to be able to sustain them, we'll be able to improve the services in an oil like gas in attracting enabling environment for other companies into river states. In sustaining the aspect of agriculture, if we give adequate attention, we will be able to address the fundamental issues that brought the state to where it is today. The major issue we will find, and the only way we can as well make progress in our economic situations in the state, is to address the fundamental issues from restiveness and ethical behaviors in the state. If we are able to develop that, we will create foundations will be able to break, 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 create a better path to be able to steer the economy on the aspect of, of the agriculture, fuel engineering and technical services, and oil and gas will obviously have to prosper. We cannot achieve beyond what we have today in the atmosphere of violence and restiveness. Our youth, our, as a people, 
we need to retrain ourselves. We need to reorientate ourselves to be able to develop our people to appreciate the realities in developing this state in better perspective. I have no doubt that if we have the right attitude of people, we will be able to create the enabling environment to sustain our investment. Thank you very much. We go now to the second set of questions. Question two, and conducive environment for business. The issue of multiple taxation from federal, state, and local government tax agencies has become a major impediment for many companies in Nigeria. And in some other states, River State has been known for multiple taxation, demands from touts and other harassments. Many companies have indeed left River State as a result of this challenging situation. As we face falling revenues due to low oil prices, there will be pressure to create new taxes or increase existing taxes to maintain or increase revenue. Tell us, as a governor, how will your administration strike a balance between improving internally generated revenue and creating a better environment for business growth? And I will start with you, candidate SDP. Your time starts now. Well, it is the compass of all the local governments and all the communities that make the state. So that is why in my program I have said that 35% of all taxes must go to the host communities where those taxes are generated. 15% will go to the local government. 50% will go to the state. When you do that, any taxpayer pays in three envelopes. 35% to the ward government or the community government, 15% to the local government, 50% to the state. Because I'm going to decentralize the government to make sure that community governments award their contracts for their roads. They do their maintenance. They do a lot. My state government will do more into industrialization and education to make sure that we're able to um, meet our needs on time. I do not expect communities to wear down, to come and appeal to the governor, to come and maintain their roads. So there is not the proper definition of how taxes will go. That's why they have these multiple taxes. While the state government takes the taxes, they do not remit to the local government and the communities, and they do not also go and meet up their responsibilities to do the work. So in order to avoid that situation, I will introduce these three envelopes to pay taxes. One will be the, the word of community government tax. So if, it, if total uh, tax is 100 naira, 50 goes to the state, 15 goes to the local government, 35 goes to the community government. That way, all sectors, all branches of government have their share. So there will be no need for multiple taxes. But when the state government takes the whole taxes, and then they have nothing for the local government and the community government, then you find out that they are triggered to also go and look for their own share of the taxes. So I think that with the policies I have, it will be a better environment for the companies and industries to stay without having the problem of uh, multiple taxation. Thank you so much, candidate SDP. Candidate ADP, as a governor of River State, how will your administration strike a balance between improving internally generated revenue and creating a better environment for business growth?
revenue internally. Our IGR will move significantly. And we must make sure that we are not following what other states are doing. Some states are taxing people beyond imagination. We do not need to generate revenue by asking those working in our environment or in our state to overpay. But we can allow them to make some money. By making money, they would help us with employment. By helping us with employment, our people will start having the ability to spend money, and by that, you would kickstart our economy. The economy needs to be kickstarted because our economy is grounding. We must agree that River State is not what it used to be. For me, I think that River State has gone to the barest minimum, the lowest it can go. The time to take it up has come. And I think um, tax, companies investing, and all that must be a priority of River State government as governor of River State. Thank you so much, candidate ADP. Candidate Labour Party, as a governor, how will your administration strike a balance between improving internally generated revenue and creating a better environment for business growth? Your time starts now. Thank you very much, Shegu. And um, we have, uh, have two follow-up questions. First to the candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Isaac Wong. Initially, uh, you did say that you would uh, pursue agriculture as a um, vehicle to improve the state's economy. But this all, you didn't give us specific on which agricultural policies you would pursue, because it's easy to say you would pursue agriculture or use agriculture as a vehicle. For instance, you can tell us which crops, agricultural products in River State do we have comparative advantage in which parts of the state and what plants do you have in your policy document to use that to improve the fortunes of River State. That's number one. And to Mr. Isaac Wong, you talked about, you know, harmonizing the tax regime in River State and ensuring that businesses operate in the state and pay their taxes peacefully. Now, River State has tried for 15 years to harmonize taxes. It has not succeeded. What exactly do you have? What exactly is your plan to harmonize taxes to obtain a record of 15 years that we've not been able to solve? So we'll start with you, Mr. Abel Patrick. You have two minutes. Time starts now. Our 
soils are very good soils for two types of rice. And I'm sure we also have large scale of land all over in River State. And if we use part of this land through a proper acquisition from the various communities, we can cultivate rice in large scale. And if we cultivate rice, rice is a very big business around the world. With rice, we will feed the good people of River State. With rice, we can export to various countries or various communities. And I think if we also establish rice farms with the rice milling machines in each senatorial zones or LGS in the state, within two years, we will be able to have a very large scale of rice production in River State. We're also talking about cassava. Cassava has its own value chain. In each of these products, we can as well feed the people of River State. Even if you're talking about even the Miyagari itself, there are processment processes that we can develop through a mechanized process. And this also will as well engage our youth and our people in bringing about revenue and sustaining the state. And if you also look at the aspects of uh, other or what you call a yam. You have yam floor, you talk about the, um, um, what do you call it, um, um, corn. You have other byproducts of corn. Thank you so much, candidate Labour Party. Mm. Candidate ADP. Um, for the Action Democratic Party government, I think um, we will do agriculture in the best and the simplest way possible. We will just focus on um, corn, cassava, and plantain main focus. That does not say we will not grow the little, little um, requirements of our people in the state. Yes, of course, um, the farmer can have a small garden where they grow uh, crops, produce that they will eat. But we must do, like I said earlier on, serious mechanized agriculture. The investment is going to come partly from the river state government, partly from PPP, where interested people will be interested in investing, and it's going to come from those who are interested in the produce. We had a Chinese company not too long in River State asking how they can get 6 million metric tons of cassava out of River State yearly. And we looked at it and said it's impossible because we don't have any policy. For us in agriculture, we will get small settlements inside the major farms. We will set up cooperatives where landowners will put all their land together so that we will be able to farm bigger and better. And in doing that, we will be able to export um, a lot of the agricultural produce. For tax uh, harmonization, you have 15 years. You cannot harmonize tax when you've eliminated what you want and what you don't want to pay. People are hungry on the streets. So when the local government says go look for revenue, they are looking for all the revenues that you just decided you don't want to be taxed. You don't want companies to be taxed. So it is a difficult thing to do unless a government sits down properly to decide what to do. And what to do, I think, is to make sure that you tax less and get more out of the companies. Thank, Thank you so you. much, candidate ADP. Gentlemen, we'll go to the third question on the, category, on the economic category. And this time we'll be talking on employment. Seaports play an important role facilitating most nations' external trade. They are also important job generators. The extent of the employment effects of ports directly or indirectly induce and related activities represents millions of jobs and a significant contribution to economic growth. Port Harcourt has two seaports that can be regarded as poor performing ports in terms of job creation for the citizens of the state. Tell us, both the Onair and Port Accord port are federally controlled, we know, and taking this into account, what do you think a state government can do to help make these sea ports more functional and an economy by economically viable hub for goods in the region. And I will start with you, candidate SDP. 
Your time starts now. The state government would want to find out is it a political reason or is it administrative reason that our two seaports are not functioning. Meanwhile, more than 80% of the importers are from the eastern part of Nigeria. So we'll take steps to ensure that if there are negotiations, if there are issues with the federal government, we will be able to resolve that. I'm sure that within the first, first 30 days of our administration and make sure our seaports are functioning. Now I'm aware that the Podakot port is on concession to Dangote. What we can do as a state government, we can build batting quays opposite, uh, behind Isaka and the Bakana axis. And that still becomes an extension of the Potakot seaport because the Orne seaport has a problem where there is transshipment done um, between Boni to Orne. But the Potakot seaport, if you are taken from that point, the, 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 the ships go in and out. And so what we will do is to take steps to ensure that whatever bottleneck, whatever thing that is wrong, that our seaports are not functioning, to get them functioning as quickly as possible. Because that is a major chunk of the economy for which Lagos is making over 30 billion every month. That's 360 billion a year. So even if we're able to have 30, 35% of that, that will give us close to uh, 150 billion every year. And that is a substantial part of the economy. And that's what we want to focus on as soon as we come in. Because we are going to go into full industrialization. We are already planned that we are going to support all local governments with 5 billion naira yearly for industrialization. So we intend that within four years of our administration, we should have 92 industries. Meanwhile, these industries have nothing to do with the cottage industries that is mostly agro-based because we are going to do more of micro-economic approach and leave those, industry, those cottage industries with the communities. For if, some, if a community is growing pineapple, it doesn't need to be a state government involvement. It doesn't need a local government involvement. You leave it with the community. They'll be able to manage it properly. They can incorporate a company of their own and manage those things. Not everything the state's government needs to be involved in. fact. I want to run a government where the, the community at the world level does most of the administration, and then the local government is doing more of supervisory, and the state government is doing more of supervisory. Thank you so much, candidate SDP. Candidate ADP, so tell us, knowing that both the ONE and Port Harcourt Ports are federally controlled, but taking this into account, what do you think a state government can do to make this seaport a functional and economically viable hub for goods in the region? Well, I think I've said that uh, every time I've spoken here tonight. I've said that without security in river states, nothing can work. If we do not secure the waterways, vessel owners will not put their vessel, will not risk their vessel to come to Port Harcourt or an airport. Between Borne and on airport, or between Bonnie and Port Harcourt, I can bet you five hijacks can take place. We must secure the waterways first. We must secure the entire river state first. When that is done, investors will rush in that we will be in a situation where we might not be able to um, handle the rush of investors into the state. It used to happen before. River State had a company called Parbot. If you remember Parbot, Everybody was coming to invest under the name of Parbot. We had Parbot Marines, we had um, Parbot Water Glass Boatyard, we had all sorts of uh, things Parbot was doing, shopping and all that. But at the end of the day, it was because the environment was secure. So if we secure, our ports will run automatically because I know there are people who import goods into Port Harcourt, but they use the Lagos seaports because it's safer. And then um, they pay the extra costs by coming by road to um, River State. I think we need to focus on those things that are necessary. I said earlier that an ADP government in six months will be done with security in River State. It is not as difficult as building an aircraft. It is as easy 
as going to Bonnie to call some boys out and some uh, stakeholders out, as easy as going to Abuniman to say, come, we want to see you in Portacot. It's as easy as sending a message to any part of Ogonia and say, you come together, let's talk. And after that discussion, we must fashion out a way to secure our state. And if that happens, hooray, the place is open for business and the investors will come. Thank you so much, candidate ADP. Candidate Labour Party, tell us, in your view, what do you think a state government can do to help make our two seaports a functional and economically viable hub for goods in the region? Obviously, the now. obviously, the issue of the seaports and business of the marines has bothered so much on insecurity. Our security agencies has a lot to do to minimize the level of insecurity on our waterways. These are important to be able to attract businesses in our seaports. More so as a government, we will establish an agency that will be able to look at the issues on our seaports or our sea uh, within the marine areas as a business, identify with the foreigners or investors on the ways we can as well liaise with the federal government identify with the issues and ensure that our business will strive in the state. Thank you so much, candidates, Labour Party. Candidates, we have follow-up questions to your answers. Thank you very much. Um, candidate SDP, uh, Mr. Precious Alekima, nice idea. You talk, you're talking about, you know, spending and sharing. Um, I don't know if the government will be a spending and sharing government. You talked about sharing money across the state, local, and, um, and ward levels. You've talked about spending five billion naira in each local government every year to set up um, a macro or micro um, industry, if I'm not mistaken. Um, isn't it better to look at a, a greater private sector participation approach where government doesn't have to spend so much money because investors are looking for where to invest? If you don't want a full private sector investment approach, we talk about public-private partnership. Aren't these better than looking at a full-blown investment and spending by government? In this time, when we're talking about shortfall in government revenue, which you equally commented on here today. Okay, this is what, what I see. We already have a situation where, because of security situations, a lot of companies have pulled out. So they do not have confidence, they think it's a high-risk area. So we as a government, we know that we are going to ensure that within three months, we sort out the security issue. Then we need to provide the necessary guarantees. Because if we do not do it, and we say that we are not going to provide funding guarantees for investments to come in, we'll end up paying amnesty monies. Investment guarantees will return back the monies. Amnesty monies goes to the boys' pockets. So I would prefer to encourage investors who will be in partnership with government to ensure that we're able to build industries. Now, we will be the first that will start it. Very recently, the United States gave out bailout funds to companies once they saw that the companies were failing because they were looking at the social problem. When we came back from the Civil War, the Spiff administration assumed the position of entrepreneurship and, the, and they were guided by the principles of economics of what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. And they initiated companies like Metalloplastica, Nigerian Engineering Works, uh, Water Glass Portier, uh, all sorts of companies, totaling about 38 companies that provided employment and provided the initial internal uh, local economy for River State. As far as I'm concerned, we're going to follow that, but with some differences. We, if we, because the banks will say there is no money. So what we have the state has to do is to create the necessary guarantees to attract investment. Thank you so much, candidate SDP. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much. Now we go to the next set of questions. And these questions will order on security. Sorry. 
I would like to provide a preamble first. The concern over security has been a topic of national concern, as you're well aware, during this election campaign, selection season. There are critical issues nationally, but River State has special reason to be worried, as there were major breakdowns in security in the years following elections in 2003, 2007, and 2015. There are also credible indicators that tensions and violence risks may be as bad as these previous years, uh, based on the disruption in the state during the recent presidential and national assembly elections. Gentlemen, as you've mentioned during the session on economy, security and the local economy are strongly connected. Without security, you cannot have investment. Without security, we'll continue seeing families relocate. And obviously, this has an associated impact on employment. And this has obviously become a vicious cycle, which is probably responsible for the protracted violent conflict in some parts of River State. So on to the first question, and in particular to candidates ADP and SDP, who have given a period during which they believe they will sort out the issues related to insecurity in case they are elected. ADP candidate, you mentioned six months, I believe. Um, SDP candidate, I think you mentioned three months. I would like to start with the ADP candidate. If elected, what strategies would you employ to ensure that River State is able to provide a secure um, environment for our families and also businesses? Okay. Um... Our administration, the ADP administration, we have four-point agenda for River State. We will create the enabling environment, which is the first one. We will come into business development. And the third one is fairness and equity. And the last is political reforms. I want to state categorically that insecurity in River State is a creation of the way we play our politics. It is because of politics that there is insecurity in River State. Our politicians now think that when they win, they take everything away, as if it's theirs. But it's for the River State people. It's for the entire state. We, the fourth agenda, like I said, is politics. We will reform our political space in River State. You come into government, it takes another four years for the next election. Every time within this four years period, we must educate and rearrange reverse people that we do not need to fight when we get to an election. For you, when you win, you must carry all the other parties along. And that is why I am coming into this um, election as a candidate that is here to make peace for Rivers people, I will be the peacemaker. I will make sure that all the warring factions stop to go to war because it will give us the security we all need. I can name examples of those who are warring. And believe me, as governor of River State, I would bring them together. Governor Mechi is not in good terms with Mrs. Jonathan, I will make sure that those two people come together and become best of friends. And that is the only way River State can move ahead. I can tell you that Governor Wiki is keeping enemies in River State, political enemies, and that is not good for the health of River State. We must have the ability to say that this is our problem and make sure we attack them frontally. And I think the time has come to make that peace. That is why I'm offering myself in River State to be that peacemaker that will make sure that River State will come together, there will be security, and we can all develop together in one way without looking back. Because whatever we achieve is all ours. It's not for one group. Candidate SDP, you mentioned that if elected as governor, it would just take you three months to deal with insecurity. How exactly do you intend to do that? Well, first... Uh... Insecurity in River State is, uh, is drama in Hollywood. Failure in transparency in leadership. There must be consequence for actions. 
You can't reward a fool. Somebody kills, you reward him. Somebody behaves somebody, you reward him. Nobody is bigger than the state, so we will enthrone law and order and make sure that there must be law and order. And once you divorce government from criminals, because what you have is that there are two enemies to the people. First is criminals, second is government. Now these two people are from the union and government officials protect criminals. That's what happens. There is somebody that builds them. I give an example. Recently, some people were paraded that they have stuffed ballot boxes. Soldiers caught them with ballot boxes. And after two days, you saw them in a very happy celebrating mood that they have been released by government ministries or whatever. You saw them in the ministry. So what happens is that now those people will continue and others will continue because there is no consequence for what they had done. So what I will do is that, first of all, I will need to free myself that I as governor, I have no business with criminals. Second, all my officials must ensure they do not phone any DPU, any police barracks to release anybody. We will ensure that there are magistrates for nearly all the wards to ensure for speedy delivery of uh, justice. We will make sure that people face consequences for action. I can tell you nobody is strong. Nobody is hard. As soon as we do that, you start jailing people who will amend the criminal code to start with about 30, 40 years. When somebody of 25 years is jailed for 40 years, by the time you, you won't even do up to 10 cases. Before you know, all parents will be calling their children, brothers and sisters will be calling their children. I can tell you that it's drama they are acting. Why people come into it is when we were growing up, uh, going abroad was what was the in thing. Now, people see that carrying gun and carrying knife propels you to go to the House of Assembly, propels you to become commissioner, propels you to be political leader. So once the narratives change, people are just falling and children coming behind, that's what they see. So as far as I am concerned, by the time we start, once they arrest the first one, the second one, they see that nobody is being released and they're going to jail. I can tell you that within 90 days, you'll see a massive, a massive drop in the entire system. And we're going to have peace. Thank you so much, candidates. Candidates would like to advise you that you should refrain from calling names. Thank you, candidates. Candidate Labour Party, if elected as governor, what strategies would you actually use to deal with the current challenges of insecurity in the state? The issue of insecurity in River State has bordered on leadership. And if we are voted in as governor of River State, we will not patronize criminality. We will also center more on training and retraining of our youths. We will invest more on human capital development to reorientate our people over time in key in, in the realities to develop the state. As much as there have been rival issues between political or politicians in River State, our resources have so much been wasted on those areas. Perhaps even some of the youth have seen criminalities or crime as a way of life. Nobody wants to criticize it. And the issue of criminality has gone beyond the system. It's cut across all spheres of our life, even with our communities, ranging to the religious circles, to the government circles. As much as we want to take off leadership, we will ensure that there are rule of law. We we'll also want to ensure that the various institutions of government are strengthened to be able to fight and show some leadership skill and integrity to be able to pursue such factors. We will also liaise with the federal government to ensure that the institutions of agencies of government, particularly the security agencies, do the needful. The judiciary have to live also to its expectations. And I'm sure when there are occurrences of people 
paying price for their actions, the crime and insecurity will definitely have to reduce, provided we as government do not patronize the thoughts and the hoodlums in the state. Thank you. We have a follow-up question. Okay. Um, follow-up question for the candidate of the ADP, Mr. Victor Fingasi. You, you said you'd be, you'd go to the creeks and the villages and communities and you would call out um, some of these uh, criminal elements and, and talk to them. You also said um, that you'd be speaking to a, a former governor of River State, uh, former First Lady of River State, and you talked about the governor of River State, present governor of River State. Now, there are elements in the security, who are part of the security problem in River State, who are not part of the triangle that you talked about, persons you talked about, be it the former First Lady, be the former governor, or the serving governor of River State. There are security, there are elements that are not part of this. For instance, you have those who are criminal thieves, you have those who are militants, those who are what we call bunkers, those who are kidnappers, they don't care about Mr. A or Mr. B. They're just doing their thing. And you can't call them out and talk to them because they are hidden. How exactly are you going to tackle these people? The kidnappers, those who are into crude theft or what we call bunkers, militants, and cultists for a problem in this state. We need to know that there is hunger and poverty in River State. We also need to know that when people found, find themselves in a situation where they are hungry, they do just anything. We need to change the environment so that this environment can start catering for our youths. We need to also realize that the people we are referring to are not spirits. There are people that we know. Like I said, I'm a security expert. They are all people that I know from across the riverine communities and across the upland communities. All I'm saying here is that people must come together to surge ahead, to plan ahead, and to achieve. Because what is happening today is affecting all of us in River State. Headlines will say rivers of blood. When they should say rivers of people who love themselves. So I'm saying that it is possible you can call them out. You don't know them. I know them. And I'm saying I know them because I'm a security expert. The police knows everybody that uh, creates insecurity. We cannot be in denial all our lives and uh, not solve our problem. You say a guy is a criminal. Criminals are given amnesties in some countries and they turn around to become the best of human beings. We cannot sit down and continue to condemn and condemn instead of trying out new ways of making sure that we eliminate the problems around us so that we can be able to develop our dear river state. Candidates, thank you so much. As critical stakeholders in river states, have you at any time submitted a proposal to any government, either in the past or present, on how to curb the security challenges in the state? If you have, what was the reaction? And I will start with candidate Labour Party. Obviously, from our own observations, the insecurity has bordered on leadership. And you cannot also send in proposals when the leadership is weak. You want to see a leadership that are proactive, that need to condemn the issue of illegality. You need to see and see a government that have respect for the rule of law. You need to also appreciate the government that need to enforce the laws and regulations. If you have such lapses, you might also be risking yourself in making such proposals for solutions. Otherwise, the government has all the necessary machineries to be able to curtail the issues of insecurity in the past years. Insecurity in River State is not today. It has started over time. And today, we're beginning to see a rasta child, or I mean, a lawlessness, I was aware of life. And people beginning to exercise very high level of impunity. This we must find a way to cut out. And as a leader, and as the government of River State, 
we will ensure that we do not actually patronize any illegalities. I will have respect for the rule of law. Thank you. Candidate SDP, I want you to answer some question. Have you in the past or present submitted a proposal to either the present government or past government on how to curb insecurity? And if you had, what was the reply? I haven't submitted written uh, proposals, but I have informally discussed with uh, most of the past governments and um, um, other present or past. And uh, the issue is you must be willing to say, this is what I want to do. And then those down the ladder, who are the people around you, must also purge themselves and purify themselves before that work on success. But largely, it depends on you, the man on the seat, that this is what I want to achieve. And this is why, and, and the, the people working near you, they see your body language. If your body language is such that you announce in the afternoon that you are looking for the criminals, and in the evening, the criminals are in one of the guest houses where police cannot reach them and they are eating, then the people know that these are friends of government. So largely, that's what has happened. And uh, that has given rise to impunity and had given rise to, um, in fact, more, more recruits because the older ones are getting more rewards. So, but I think that I have spelled out my approach. I'm going to go full swing on the law, and I know that once the law starts catching up with people, we will see a massive decline that you don't expect. All what happens is because there is a, a union and a marriage, so it is growing. But just start some actions. If you cast your mind back, look at how many criminals that have been brought down or those that have been put to book. The heavens didn't fall. So if we do that as a government and they understand that this is what we're doing, I'll tell you what, we'll have peace. All what it is is a tacit approval as it were from government, that's what uh, creates what we see as insecurity. Candidate ADP, tell us, either in the past or present, have you submitted a proposal as a critical stakeholder in River State to any of the governments on how to curb security challenges, and what was the response? To River State government, I haven't. To the oil companies in River State, operating in River State, I have, to almost all of them. I said earlier, I'm a security expert, and I've advised the oil industry because I worked in the oil industry on how to face security challenges. To the River State government, my reason for having not submitted a security proposal to them is in the past. I've been submitting proposals and proposals and proposals, and I never get anything back from River State. And I don't need to continue and continue when I know I will not get anything back from River State. So I thought helping some of the companies in River State is as good as helping a part of River State, if not all of River State. And I worked with the big oil companies you know that are located here in River State. My proposals helped them. My proposals brought them closer to people who are supposed to create this security for them. In the process, people were employed. In the process, doused the insecurity. And I think that's the best way to go. You cannot sit down and want to be very uh, high-handed on a situation that is bad for all of us. We must create the best formulas that we can use to solve our problems. And I think for security in River State, there must be a security conference where everybody must sit down, all the stakeholders, to agree. Because the stakeholders, too, have their problems. The truth is that there is no kidnapper in River State who is not afraid of being caught by the security services. So everybody has a problem. So we must come together and solve our problems. Gentlemen, there is currently a national debate um, that has focused or is focusing on the modification of the current national security architecture to include non-state security actors such as vigilante groups given the prevalent security challenges within the country. In River State, as you're well aware, 
some of the riverine areas have been very prone to insecurity. Practically speaking, what will you do to ensure community level security, especially given that security, the function of security provisioning is still centralized? In other words, it is still controlled by the federal government. I will start with Labour Party. Obviously, with the present political situation, a state like River State, it might be difficult to achieve in such level of security because every institution in River State is as good as politicized. Every step taken is politicized and people have been so derailed in a political assessment of situations. The political situation or insecurity in our various local localities has gone so bad that even if you create any agency or any uh, security apparatus and all that, it will be misinterpreted and people will abuse it. And that's why we insist that we need to reorientate our people, train them back on what we call human capital development, which will also include an ethical behavior for people to understand and how to actually operate and live together. And see that illegalities is not a word of life because our cycle has changed over time. In every environment now, we celebrate criminalities. We celebrate crimes. It is the wrong ones that we actually give amplos to. So we need to see how we can reorientate our people and ensure that, yes, we have a better society to live in. And that's only when the government will strive and the community will strive. Candidate SDB. Yeah, my position is these communities don't have money. You can't fight security without money. And that's why I say that when I set up my community government, they will have resources with them. That way the DPO does not, or wherever officers are there, do not depend on handouts from people. Because most communities live by contribution, that they have to take care of DPO, they have to take care of security concerns. But as a government, once there's a community government and they have their budget for security, and even if we're going to have vigilantes, we'll not have vigilantes that will carry arms, we'll probably put up like spy informants. Because you must take actions that does not become counterproductive. So at the best of it, you can have like, uh, um, neighborhood watch kind of, but not carrying arms at all. Just be able to inform the conventional security forces because it is the neighbors that know when a new face comes in within any society. So as far as I am concerned, if you do not fund the communities, you cannot achieve anything. And I, why people live in Portacourt and they feel that Portacourt is safe? Because the seat of government is here. There is no seat of government in any of the villages. There is no one community that has this uh, money from government. So the whole activity is in Port Harcourt. So had it been all the communities are receiving their monies, they will be able to put up their own securities. I want to say that we should remember that we are operating an American system of presidential uh, system of government, and we are doing it wrongly here. In the U.S., it is the cities that are working. Here we have come here with the same constitution and here we have stopped at the local government level while the people reside in the cities. So when I come in, I'll do the full interpretation of the constitution the way it is and put up the city government and ensure that the center uh, of uh, the nerve centers becomes the cities. And uh, from that point, everybody lives in a city, even the government house is in a city or in the world area. That way we can put control to most of these things. I don't believe that being a super governor by holding all the monies at the center will make me a good governor. I want to decentralize the government and disperse monies so that we can have um, uh, republic governments, small republic governments everywhere so that we can have direct supervision simultaneously. Thank you. Candidate AGP. Neighborhood Watch, it's very good. It is good because 
It is those in the communities that can tell you what has happened in those communities. I will set up the neighborhood watch from the first month in government. I will not wait three months, four months to the end of my administration to set it up. So that within those years, the communities would blend properly with those who are in neighborhood watch. The rural, um, traditional rulers will be involved in neighborhood watch. They can chair it. Where you go, tell them your subjects are doing this and by their subjects. And the rural so-called chairman, who is like the traditional ruler, either a chief or a king or whatever, can now get in touch with people in Port Harcourt. Let's not forget, let's not forget, Nigerian police is inadequate in Nigeria. Even the military is inadequate. I'm talking of in terms of number. We don't have enough policemen to police Nigeria. We have the population of policemen to the citizens in Nigeria. There is no one policeman that can watch over 200 persons. It's not possible. So we must create things that would help us oversee and overlook and secure our environments for us. The smaller they are, the better. If I go, let me take a community for example. If I go to Eche, one village in Eche, there is a major crime. There is no way the traditional ruler there, who is the chief, and those who are part of this neighborhood watch cannot tell you what has happened in their communities. They must be able to tell you that in this community last night, that family, the boy from that family did this. And I think it's easier to check that way. We cannot see good projects and condemn them. Neighborhood Watch, I think, is a good project, uh, a project that when you carry out will help, will help to solve your insecurity. Thank you, gentlemen. This will probably be the final question under this session. We don't have any follow-up questions. Uh, security is not just about physical safety. There is also what they call human security, which also includes enabling citizens have access to social services such as education, health, but there's also the environment. And I'd like to focus on certain aspects of the environment. You know that currently Port Harcourt and different parts of River State are suffering from air pollution. Um, and I think you have noticed this in some parts of Port Harcourt with um, the suit. You know, it's a sort of a black, you know, black dust. You see it in your houses. You see it on your cars. And we know that currently the environmental laws are basically um, enacted by the National Assembly and House of Reps, and the agencies are federal in nature. However, this problem is local in nature. What will you do to ensure that locally this problem is addressed without necessarily having to rely on the federal government or its agencies to intervene? We'd like to start with candidate ABP. I said earlier that river states, all we find these days is hunger and poverty. And when you talk about the suits over us, it's because people have to feed themselves. People have to fend for themselves. People have to survive. In trying to survive, they do all sorts of things, both good things and criminal things. I have said here earlier on that modular refineries will solve the problem of not only the air pollution, but also of the water pollution. If you have modular refineries, and it's not that difficult to get, we will partner with investors. We will get the federal government to also understand that pollution is not the best for this environment. I'm sure all of us know that river states or the entire Niger Delta. We've been talking about oil pollution since most of us here were born. It's not a new phenomenon. The companies were one time polluting. Now the individuals are beginning to pollute. So all I'm saying, when the companies were polluting, they were doing that for profit. Now the individuals are polluting. They're also doing that for profit to survive. So we must 
look for a way in between. And I think modular refineries will do the work. I also believe that to find the investors for modular refinery will not be a difficult thing. We are not friendly to those who want to invest in Nigeria. Before you can invest in Nigeria, you need a borehole, you need a generator, you need too many things you need. You need licenses for this and for that. There are countries in the world where you just go and do whatever you want to do. All that the government is interested in is pay your tax. All the profit you've made, you pay your tax. But I don't think that these environmental problems will stop when this hunger continues. So we must create that situation that will bring these investors that would help us eliminate all these problems. They are easy to eliminate. When you take off people, there are people who are doing it. There are people who are going to buy those products for their generators or for their vehicles. So you know who is selling to you. Like um, somebody said earlier on, who are they? Of course we know who these people are. And those who are buying it can say, I bought from Mr. So So So. So at the end of the day, I think we can get them, redirect them to something else, or do it properly by the modular uh, refinery uh, system, which will help everybody and also help the owners of oil. Candidate Labour. Well, the issue of black suits <clears throat> perhaps have been said to be probably as a result of illegal oil bomb raids or what they call uh, bomb fire. I think we have all the enabling laws and agencies to tackle the issue of environmental pollution. Even if there is a rising or an increase in pollution, but as a result of um, illegal bunkers or whatever activities that are actually being done, there are security agencies. If they are sincere and proactive to the job, we should be able to arrest such situations. But the situation we find ourselves in River State has been lawlessness. And people will also be getting to come to River State to borrow the same behavior and begin to exhibit lawlessness in other environments. And that's why, perhaps as Labour Party, if we find ourselves in government, we will support the central government in fight against corruption. Because the basic issues are bordered on corruption and lawlessness. Until we achieve these factors, we cannot make a way forward in this country. The pollution, the illegalities are man-made. It has continuously increased over time. It's not even reducing. So we must ask ourselves a question, what are the agencies doing? What are the law enforcement agencies doing? I think these are questions left to us to actually answer. And I want to believe that if we find ourselves in government, we want to join hands with the federal government in war against indiscipline and war against corruption. We will definitely get there over time. Candidate SDP. Ironically, federal government says they spend so much money in subsidizing, but these young men don't spend money in subsidizing. So all what is wrong is that they use wrong equipment. So I'm going to organize them into cooperative societies where the government should be able to arrange banks to fund them to have the necessary equipment to establish the modular refineries. Because there is nobody to give them loan. They do not have the collaterals to have loans to do this business. So we, are, we must say, okay, we want to save the society. Yes, but these boys must do it the wrong way. So for me, you can't, do, you can't open modular refineries for everybody. So if they are 15, 20, 30, set up a cooperative society, set up one modular refinery, and do it the right way, so that the society will have cheap energy, clean energy, that will not disturb their generators or their cars and the rest. I, I am sure that we will be able to achieve quite a lot doing it that way. I don't want to pretend that you will tell them that you will get investors. First of all, you have a society where they already say it's high risk. So how many people want to come? But I believe that by the time we, the state government, is able to use our funds through the banks to guarantee the equipment that these young men need, 
to set up the Mulder refineries, then that will be the step in the right direction. Because if you leave them to go, they will never go to get it. And then you cannot stop them from doing what they're doing. And then the public suffers at the end of the day. So for me, it's to accept the reality to say that something is wrong. How do we solve the problem? There may be 400 in numbers. Maybe River State has close to, maybe they want to license 10 um, modular refineries. Put them into a cooperative society, 40 into one. And we set up the modular refineries. And then, so what they want to achieve in the crude way that is disturbing the environment, we avoid it. And it's a win-win situation for themselves and for the people and for the federal government and the state government, and then we get taxes that they pay to us. I think this would be my approach to stop this thing. I don't want to pretend to say there will be soldiers, there will be police, there will be security. It's not going to work until we're able to come into terms with the realities and make sure that we have moderate refineries financed or somehow the state, I believe that the banks don't give money to anybody. So the best thing to do is to make provision to ensure that they overcome the issue of access to funds, and then we can solve that problem. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We now move to the third and final session of this debate, which will focus on open governance. Thank you very much, Florence, and thank you very much, candidates, uh, in this part of the debate. We'll be asking you uh, questions that focus on strictly on open government. And um, what do we mean by open government? In a technical sense, open government describes the idea that citizens have the right to access the documents and the proceedings of government. They have the right to access the documents and the proceedings of government. This has been quite difficult in the past and even to an extent present. Um, and this will allow for effective oversight um, of government activities. Now, in a practical sense, open government that can be described as a willingness to share government information that will help public to participate in the decisions that affect them. And we have practical examples all around us. You know, people get into government and then the people can't access them, neither can they access information, you know, on the activities and the spending, very importantly, of government. It also assumes that government is ready to improve the day-to-day -day input of the public into decisions they make about services, strategy, and spending. So government draws up a budget and people have no input into it. It doesn't take account, into account the needs of different parts of the state. So open governance or open government has a very poor record in Nigeria. Now to the first question, gentlemen. Question one. Many states and the federal government allow ministries to give an annual briefing or presentation of the activities to all questions and review. Um, but this has sadly not happened in River State. Now, some states also, and the federal government, allow and provide a budget breakdown. In fact, the commissioners of some of these states and ministers, some ministers at the federal government level, provide budget breakdown sessions to the public, especially the media. We have labor, we have civil society, we have the business community, non-governmental organizations, but in River State we've not seen um, much of this. Now, River State is one of the states where citizens, especially the press, labor and civil society, say they do not get to see the budget, either in fiscal form or online. In fact, some politician famously said the budget could be hacked if it is put online. Gentlemen, if elected, what will be your plan to instill the principles of transparency, collaboration, and participation of the various organs of your government into the engagement with the public? If elected, what will be your plans to instill the principles of transparency, collaboration, and participation of the various organs of your government into their engagement with the public? That's question 1A. Question 1B. If elected as governor 
of River State in the 2019 elections. Candidate ADP, candidate Labour Party, candidate SDP. Will your government make the River State yearly budget open and available, or is there a danger that you perceive in having an open budget system? We start with candidate SDP. Well, you know that the budget comes from actions. So you, you, you find that if the government has no plan and they take all budgets and just remove the figures and add up and announce a budget, this is what you find. But if a government has a plan, it is from the plan that the budget starts with. So now, normally the service runs in an ascending order. But right now, the service runs in a descending order. The professionals don't do no job. The governor, maybe, I don't know, but most times, the civil servants are waiting for the actions of a governor. Maybe a friend has made a proposal to a governor, and based on that proposal, actions have been taken. Now, but what I'll do is this. We will have proper budget sessions. There will be reason for what we want to spend the money for. And my budget will have the community budget, the world government budget, the local government budget, and the state government budget. We are going to have a state development plan for which all the items will be drawn up. And the community government will pick what they will be able to execute. The local government will pick what they will be able to execute. The state government will pick what they will be able to execute. At the end of the calendar year, we will know out of those items what we have taken and what is remaining. It is the governor's focus, it is his dreams that forms the budget. Then the civil service, the professionals, will put it together. Ministry of Agri will do what they want to do. The Ministry of Land will know that there's congestion, so there's a need to explain a new subdivision. Based on that, they'll bring out their budget. The Ministry of Housing will know that there's a problem. We are having acute housing problem. Based on that, they are say, okay, the Ministry of Land has acquired new subdivision. We need to build some new houses. It is based on what they want to do that creates the budget. But when you have a situation where people just pick up old budgets, remove figures, add figures, and for, merely for the sake of announcing figures, they just announce figures and run the states on their portfolios, this is what we find. So as far as I am concerned, there will be proper budgetary system based on what we want to do from the community level to the local government level and all that. And within every quarter for the state, we must publish expenditures. But for the community government, the seventh day of every new month, they must publish expenditures because they, it will be the next center of our activities. Mr. Victor Fingersi, ADP. We must, we must allow our MDAs and our LGAs to run. As government, you cannot run the ministries, the departments and the agencies yourself. There must be different heads. You cannot run the local government councils from the government house of River State. So everybody and every organ of government is supposed to run freely. Our budgets will be open to scrutiny. Our budgets every year, reverse people can look at them and say to us, you did not implement 10% of the budget. And if we don't have good reasons why we didn't, we will explain to reverse people. Because we see river state as for reverse people. We don't see river state as for those in government. It is for rivers people. And you must explain to the owners of what you've used the money to do. Accounts will be bare and open to everybody to see. At the end of every accounting year, auditors must come in to audit the accounts of River State and made public. Reason for that is that that is the only way you can improve the next time.
That is the only way you can continue to develop your state and make it robust. It is by these figures that you can get people who are experts in different areas to help encourage you to grow better and grow bigger. But when you have a situation where people can't access government information, then there is a problem. There is a problem because those in government can start running the government as if the government belongs to them. Government belongs to nobody. Beginning of when you get into power, at the end of four years, you must leave power. If you are blessed, you do another term. And after that, you must leave power. You cannot dominate the state forever. So you cannot, within your limited space, not allow everything to be scrutinized properly and be audited. So we think we will be open to reverse people to see exactly what their money is used for and how it is spent. Don't forget, they are the ones that will mainly propose to us what is required in their communities. And whoever is in charge, be it the ministry or be it the um, government agency, will be held accountable. You won't hold the governor accountable. You hold those directly um, responsible accountable. And the governor will help you to do that. All right. This is the Kwao Labour Party. Gentlemen, candidates, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please, we have just three minutes live broadcast time on radio and TV. After these three minutes, we'll be off the live radio and TV broadcast, but this debate will continue online. Thank you so much. Mr. Isaac Wong, please, you may proceed. Thank you. If we are voted in as governor of River State, and for the reason why we want to offer our services to the good people of River State, is to offer a prudent and transparent government. Importantly, we have to reform all agencies of government or we straighten all the parastatals to live up to its constitutional responsibility. We will ensure that we de-emphasize politicization of all ministries. The ministries, the civil servants, will do its job in accordance by its rule. The issue of budgetary, we will expect that every ministry and agencies of government will show transparency. All activities of government must be seen as transparent to the same people, and our budget will remain open. I can tell you that one of the important reasons of asking to serve good people of River State is to share accountability and good prudence of service. And I can assure you that, and that is what we want to live up to our expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to remind uh, uh, each candidate that you have, at the end, a chance to make a remark. You can as well make a remark on anything uh, your counterparts have said. Meanwhile, candidates and ladies and gentlemen will be going off the networks on radio and TV. But this debate will continue live broadcast on the social media and on the Twitter handle of the Rivers Debate. Once again, thank you so much, candidates. Thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we go off air on the live broadcast on radio and TV. We continue with the debate. Thank you. So much question to you.